are instructions about clickers. So uh, voting is an important part of our, uh, of our debates. And we are requesting that all of you uh, cast your votes both before each debate and after each debate. So a few rules. One is that they have to be turned on, and there will be a light uh, that will come on. I think it's a green light. Um, if for any reason your light is not working, you can just uh, raise your hand. Somebody will come around and swap out uh, your clicker. Secondly, uh, when you vote, each person only gets one vote. So if you press it 10 times, you're not going to get 10 votes. <laughs> But you can change your vote, so if you do cast your vote and you decide that you want to change your mind, please feel free uh, to do that. And uh, so that's the uh, second point. Once the voting is closed, and I will say when it's closed, then um, even if you are, uh, if you are clicking, uh, it, will not, uh, it will not register. The third thing is um, that this is all anonymous. We don't have the technology yet to know who voted which way. And uh, we often in the past have had far fewer votes than there are people in the room. So uh, please, just, yeah, make up your mind, uh, cast your vote, and we will be displaying uh, the voting both before uh, the debate and then uh, again afterwards. And for people who are watching online, uh, you'll have an ability uh, to see the voting also uh, as it takes place. And then I will announce uh, the, um, uh, the uh, final tally. So uh, we are going to start now with the first proposition, and I'm going to ask you all to cast your votes, and while you are thinking about it and while you are beginning to cast your votes, I will just give you a bit of an introduction. So our proposition is, if Beijing and Taipei do not come to an agreement on unification by 2035, China will use military force to invade Taiwan. Since President Tsai Ing-wen came to power in 2016, cross-strait tensions have intensified as Beijing has ramped up its pressure campaign against Taiwan. Official cross-strait dialogue has been suspended. The flow of Chinese tourists visiting Taiwan has dropped off steeply, and Beijing is actively poaching Taiwan's diplomatic allies. On March 31st, two Chinese fighters made a deep incursion across the center line of the Taiwan Strait for the first time in 20 years. In early January 2019, Xi Jinping gave his first comprehensive speech on policy toward Taiwan. And in that speech, he proclaimed that China reserves the option to use all necessary measures to unite Taiwan with the mainland, including use of force. But how likely is a Chinese military invasion of Taiwan? And will it happen before 2035 if the two sides do not come to an agreement? Here to debate those issues we have to my right, Jim Fennell, who is a fellow with the Geneva Center for Security Policy, former director of intelligence and information operations for the US Pacific Fleet, I will not give lengthy bios. You have all of those in your programs. To my left is Tim Heath, who is a senior international defense researcher at uh, RAND Corporation um, and also used to work at the Pacific uh, Command as well. So two terrific uh, experts to debate uh, what is a very critical issue uh, for the United States and for the region. So, the next 10 seconds, you all get to cast your vote, and then we will be closing the votes, and we will begin our debate. And then again, uh, we will have each of our speakers present their views for about 15 minutes each. They will then have five minutes each to comment or add to what they have said based on what the other speaker has said. And then we're going to turn to all of you for a few questions from the audience. And then after that Q&A session, we will have uh, the final vote. So we currently are at, let's see, 65% no, 
Okay, and 33%, yes. Okay, all right. All right, let's go. We're gonna close the vote and we are going to start um, as we will do for every debate with the, the four case being made first. Over to you, Jim. Okay. Well, it looks like I got my work cut out for me. First, I'd like to thank Bonnie and uh, CSIS for inviting me to participate in today's conference on what I believe is the main thing deterring the PRC from war. Regardless of the changed nature of the debate about the PRC here in Washington, I'm glad to be here today and to be able to debate with Tim Heath. Tim and I have had many discussions over the years from our days working together in the Pacific, and Tim is someone who I respect for his dedication to the truth, and I look forward to a robust debate about this very important topic. My thesis this morning is very simple and straightforward. While I firmly believe the People's Republic of China would prefer never to fire a single shot to unify Taiwan, the fact is the Chinese Communist Party has prepared itself for just such a contingency. After two decades of preparation, the PRC has altered the military balance of power and is now more prepared than at any other time in history to be able to conduct combat operations to unify Taiwan and thus fulfill General Secretary Xi Jinping's very explicit direction to achieve the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. For nearly half a century, the best China minds in the United States have persistently underestimated the supremacist ambitions of the Chinese Communist Party, even as they clearly communicated their intentions. We fooled ourselves in thinking that they wanted to transition to democracy, but just didn't know how that they wanted to join the rules-based world order, not change it to ensure the safety and security of totalitarianism, while tilting the trading field sharply towards themselves. They had no, and th that they had no ambitions outside their borders, which were finite, and that they would never build overseas bases, and that they, they would never challenge the United States. And here today, even as Xi has built or builds towards the world's largest navy, missile force, military satellite networks, army, air force, even as Xi tells us that the resolution of Taiwan cannot wait for the next generation, we continue to debate whether they really mean it. Frankly, it's a wonder we continue to be paid when we are so often wrong. I think the PRC ex means exactly what they tell us. As such, my assessment is that if there is no political agreement between Beijing and Taipei by 2030, 2035 at the latest, then the PRC will attack and invade Taiwan, making the next 10 years the most important decade of U.S.-China relations in history, or what I have previously described and published as the decade of concern. The best way to assess the validity of such a claim falls into two main categories. First is, what are the PRC's intentions? And second, what are the PRC's capabilities to conduct such an operation? Or to put it another way, what is it that the Chinese Communist Party tells us about this core issue? And what are they actually doing to prepare for such an outcome? On a side note, I just returned from an extended investigation into the PRC's expansion into the South Pacific. Given the overwhelming shock and surprise about this information, we should remember in June of 2017 that the PRC State Council formally and publicly announced their three blue or maritime economic passages one of which was in the South, China, the South Pacific. This is but one example. The record is full of others where the Chinese Communist Party tells us their strategic intentions in advance. And I submit that when it comes to Taiwan, they have made it clear, crystal clear, that if the PRC is unable to come up with the non-kinetic resolution to unify Taiwan, that they will unleash the People's Liberation Army to seize it. To start with, let's refresh ourselves by recalling the words of the PRC's 2000 white paper entitled The One China Principle and Taiwan Issue, which stated that Taiwan issue is one left over by the Chinese Civil War. As yet, the state of hostility between the two sides of the straits has not formally ended. To safeguard China's sovereignty and territorial integrity and realize the reunification of the two sides of the straits, the Chinese government has the right to resort to any necessary means. And while carrying out the policy of peaceful reunification, the Chinese government always makes it clear that the, the means used to solve the Taiwan issue is a matter of China's internal affairs 
and China is under no obligation to commit itself to rule out the use of force. And then it also said the resort to force would only be the last choice made under compelled circumstances. I can hear some of you saying, yeah, these are dated statements from 2000 and merely reflected Beijing's desired end state for some unspecified unification in the future. However, Xi's statements on October 2013 on the sidelines ahead of the APEC summit in Bali, Indonesia to Taiwan President Ma's envoy Vincent Xu provides a much different and chilling context. He stated, the PRC cannot wait forever for a political solution for Taiwan, signifying that the Chinese Communist Party strategy for unification is on a timeline and is not willing to kick the can down the road indefinitely. Then in January 2nd of this year, as Bonnie mentioned, Xi stated in what was called a message to the compatriots of Taiwan that Taiwan is part of China and the two sides across the strait belong to one and the same China and can never be altered by anyone or any force. And while Xi noted that the Chinese don't fight Chinese, he did go on to state that, quote, we make no promise to renounce the use of force and reserve the option of taking all necessary means, unquote. Or we can remember his October statement in Nepal where he threatened anyone attempting to split China and in any part of the country will end up crushed bodies and shattered bones. Then in this year's 2019 defense white paper, it states, solving the Taiwan problem and achieving complete national reunification is in the fundamental interest of the Chinese race. It is obviously necessary for achieving the China's, Chinese race's great renewal. China must be unified and obviously will be. China's military will pay any price to totally defeat them and protect national unification. So what then about the military capabilities of the PRC? Well, first we must understand that what we are seeing in these highly charged statements is not simply the reflection of a single leader like Xi, but reflects a continuum of guidance from successive paramount leaders who have ordered the PLA to be ready for such a task. As has been documented in Ian Easton's 2017 book, China's Invasion Threat, during the 2012 18th National Congress of the Communist Party, Xi agreed to, quote, continue the China, continue the 2020 plan, unquote, where the PLA had been ordered to have the capability to use force to take Taiwan by that year. It's worth noting the word continue as used as it reflects his, this order did not originate, originate with Xi in 2012, but had in fact started earlier by Hu Jintao. The importance of this order is reflected in the actual change in the cross-strait military balance of power over the last two decades, one that is now firmly in the PRC's favor, even when considering U.S. support. Let's review a few facts from the latest U.S. Defense Department annual report to Congress on the military and security developments involving the PRC. The PRC has 915,000 ground combat personnel in total, with 360,000 in the Taiwan Strait area. Taiwan's ground forces are just 140,000. The PLA has a total of 13 group armies, while Taiwan has just three. The PLA has 5,800 tanks to Taiwan's 800. The same disparity exists in artillery pieces with the PLA having 8,000 versus 1,000 for Taiwan. Regarding air forces, the PLA Air Force and Naval Air Forces have a total of 1,500 fighters and 450 bombers and an attack aircraft compared to just 350 fighters and zero bombers for the Taiwan Air Force. As it relates to naval forces, the PRC has two aircraft carriers, while Taiwan has none. The PLA Navy has 33 destroyers, 54 frigates, and 43 corvettes, while Taiwan has just four destroyers and 22 frigates and no corvettes. In the undersea domain, the PRC has just over 50 diesel and air independent propulsion submarines, while just two aged diesel boats for the Taiwan Navy. And when it comes to rocket forces, the PLA stands alone with 1,500 short range and 450 medium range ballistic missiles, along with another 500 plus ground launch cruise missiles that can be brought to bear in a Taiwan invasion. And this is as of today in 2019. The estimates for the size of these categories out to 2030 are much higher and reflect a two-decade trend line in the changing relative military power in the favor of the PRC, 
one that has dramatically boosted the PRC's confidence, a trend line that will only increase over the next 10 to 15 years. But maybe you think that numbers don't tell the full story, and you'd be right. What counts most is what the PLA is actually doing with all this military hardware. And on that account, the recently released U.S.-China Economic Security Review Commission's annual report provides some compelling data, some of which Bonnie mentioned. According to the report in 2019, Beijing adopted a number of stronger measures to military pressurize Taiwan. The report states the PLA carried out a series of provocative operations in waters and airspace in Taiwan that hadn't been seen for 20 years. For instance, as mentioned, on 31 March, Beijing sharply escalated military pressure tactics against Taiwan when two fighters, Chinese fighters, crossed the median line. Uh, and the last time they had crossed that intentionally uh, was in 1999. While not unprecedented, this median line crossing represents a change in the cross-state status quo and represents another disturbing trend line in the PRC military probes into Taiwan's defensive perimeter. In addition to median line crossings, the PLA has taken other actions to exert pressure on Taiwan's airspace, such as conducting circumnavigation flights around Taiwan by PLA aircraft. During conversations with Taiwan Ministry of Defense officials over the last two years, I have learned that these circumnavigation flights ramped up significantly in the summer of 2018 and continue to occur. And while these circumnavigation flights moderated somewhat in 2019, due to the National People's Conference in March and the October celebration of the 70th anniversary of the PRC's founding, they are expected to resume at higher levels following the January 2020 presidential and legislative yuan elections in Taiwan. In addition to the median line crossings and circumnavigation flights, the report makes clear the PLA conducted a series of significant training events on a scale not seen since the mid-90s. For instance, just a few weeks after the median line crossings, the PLA conducted a joint firepower assault near Taiwan involving bomber aircraft, naval surface combatants, amphibious ships, and helicopters. Then in late July and August, the PLA conducted two large-scale exercises in waters near the Taiwan Strait area, including an amphibious beach raid. This is the first time the PLA had conducted simultaneous exercises in two locations near Taiwan since the Taiwan Strait Crisis of 95 and 96. And we should not forget that since 2014, the PLA has permanently established a Joint Operations Command Center where the PLA has had five years of training for command and control of PLA forces involved in cross-strait combat operations. The importance of this experience cannot be underestimated, especially when combined with the major restructuring of the PLA that Xi instituted in 2015, highlighted with the creation of the Strategic Support Force and the Joint Logistics Force. There are more examples of the PLA preparing itself for the invasion of Taiwan, but time does not permit me to enumerate them all. What is important to say is that while all these events and activities substantially raise the risk of miscalculation, they represent a strategic trend line that demonstrates the PLA's efforts to fulfill orders from the leadership to be ready to have the capability to take Taiwan by mili military force starting in 2020. Professor June uh, Dreyer has characterized this trend line as the anaconda strategy, where each year the noose gets tighter and tighter around Taiwan's neck in order to pressure them to accept a political solution dictated by Beijing. And while I do not disagree with this characterization of Beijing's pressure campaign, given my assessment about the decade of concern that begins next year, it's at my estimation that there will be mounting pressure within the PRC to use military force to achieve the China dream of national restoration by 2049. As each week, as each day, week, month, and year pass over the course of the next decade, there will be increasing pressure within Zhang and Hai to use force. I believe these voices will crescendo sometime between 2030 and 2035 timeframe and will end in a violent military attack and invasion to seize Taiwan. Finally, a word about what I expect to be a counter-argument that all of this bellicose rhetoric, military buildup, and actions are simply part of the PRC's negotiating strategy to pressure Taipei into accepting their fait accompli, thus meaning the PRC never really intends to use military force. While I'm not an expert on Chinese negotiating theory, it seems to me the China Hands community has bought into Richard Solomon's 1999 book, Chinese Negotiating Behavior, that that postulates that the PRC uses this kind of pressure as a tool for obtaining a mutually desired 
a solution that is a win-win for everyone. Unfortunately, experience has shown that for China, a win-win solution is heads I win, tails you lose, which is entirely apparent from their activity and actions with respect to the core issue of Taiwan, or as we are witnessing in Hong Kong. Our assessments and assessment failures have consequences. They have had consequences already. Many esteemed China hands didn't take the Chinese Communist Party South China Sea intentions seriously in 2012. And after the Senkaku and Scarborough fiascos, Xi became emboldened to build military bases on reefs far from China, including one inside the EEZ of a treaty ally, the Philippines. We watched frozen and gobsmacked while they built enormous naval air stations in the Spratleys, unable to believe what we were seeing, even though they had told us they would do it, even when they released artist renderings in Hong Kong newspapers. This made Xi a national hero just as he ascended to the presidency when he most needed the political power to vanquish rivals. The PLA Navy is now consolidating the PRC's control of the South China Sea, having openly defied and dismissed the world's oldest international law tribunal. What couldn't have happened did happen because we lacked the imagination to conceive of it happening. The only part of Xi's intentions towards Taiwan that remains uncertain is what the U.S. will do. And we will, be, we will very much be a part of Beijing's go or no-go calculus. The more dismissive we are of the PRC's threat to Taiwan, the more likely Beijing is to calculate sooner and not later that it can make the expansion with acceptable consequences. Look forward to your questions. Arguing against the proposition, Tim Heath. I have some slides, I think. Can somebody help out with the slides? Um, while they're uh, getting that set up, let me first Thank Bonnie and the team at CSIS for inviting me. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. And uh, it's a real honor to be speaking before you, and it's a real privilege to uh, share the stage with Jim, Captain uh, Jim Fennell, uh, an accomplished naval officer and a formidable analyst. Um, he's laid out a, a very strong case, and uh, I'm here to offer my counter argument. The case against China deciding to invade Taiwan in 2035 comes down to this. The potential cost and risk of war far exceed in value it could possibly gain by invading to seize control of Taiwan. I will argue that although the PLA may indeed increase its advantage over Taiwan and possibly over the US in the intervening time, this, the strategic cost and risk could also go up so in sum, the bottom line up front is the, the reasons not to attack Taiwan in 2035 could actually be higher than they are even today. <clears throat> but I want to begin by my argument by granting several points to uh, Captain Fennell. First, I'm going to grant the point that the PLA's advantage will increase over Taiwan, and I will even grant that uh, Chinese military modernization will increase the advantage possibly over the U.S. I'll, I'll grant that the, the, the military capabilities of the PLA and the feasibility of an invasion may increase by 2035. I will grant that, that the Chinese are dead serious when they talk about Taiwan as a core interest and that they are serious when they say they want to see unification happen. I don't dispute that. I will also grant uh, that the belligerent rhetoric and the, and the demonstrations and the military buildup are serious. I, I reject the argument, and in and, and this I agree with Captain Fennell, that these are merely negotiating tactics, that the, the Chinese are not serious, and they're just posturing. I fully concur that they are very serious about Taiwan and they want to gain control of Taiwan. But I'm going to go in further and grant something that uh, Captain Fennell did not bring up. I'm going to point out that. Peaceful unification, I don't think, is going to happen. At this point, in 2035 and even in 2049, I, I simply do not see any way that 
China and Taiwan will peacefully unify. Here are some data points to consider. Support for unification continues to drop. It's below 10%. And, uh, and among the younger generations, support is even lower. So that number will probably decline over time. Consider that in 2035, Taiwan will have been ruling itself for 85 years. Uh, and, and China has done very little to make itself attractive to China, uh, to Taiwan, uh, with its uh, management of Hong Kong and Xinjiang as examples. Uh, it's not very appetizing uh, for the people of Taiwan. But even if China suddenly overnight became a liberal democratic country, that does not automatically mean the two will, will rush to join together. There are many liberal democracies today. Think of Britain and Spain, who are struggling with their own uh, autonomous uh, identity uh, regions. Uh, in Britain, you have Scotland, and uh, you have the Basque country in Spain. So there's something in the atmosphere that, that favors regionalization and subnational uh, identity. So I, I grant all these reasons uh, for the Chinese to consider whether to use a military option to solve Taiwan. Nevertheless, I will argue in the following slides that in every way that matters, a decision to invade would leave China worse off than finding some way to manage a situation that, that must be clearly discouraging and disappointing to authorities in Beijing, and probably to many Chinese people who, who do believe in the ideal of unification. <clears throat> so the first of two big problems for China is that a decision to invade raises the risk of a of a large-scale war whose escalation it is impossible for Beijing to control. Um, this is because an invasion of Taiwan threatens the security of many countries in Asia, and, and that is not for the reason that countries like Japan or India or Vietnam care about Taiwan per se. They may not. They may fully endorse a one-China policy and, and uh, and, and not want to change that. Nevertheless, there are three reasons why China's decision to invade Taiwan will threaten many countries. First, there is the, the capability of the PLA. Ironically, the more powerful the PLA becomes, the more capable it becomes to carry out an invasion of Taiwan, the easier it is for China to redeploy that same capability against any other country along its periphery. This is gonna be alarming and threatening to many countries. Second, what is going to compound this fear among countries in Asia is this sudden shift uh, in China's policy away from a peaceful way of managing differences with its neighbors to a decision that military aggression, invasion, and subjugation is an acceptable means of resolving differences over sovereignty and territory with any neighbor. This is going to alarm many countries. And, and uh, drive them to take their own self-defensive actions and elevate the risk that, that when the invasion begins, it could kick off a broader war. Beijing probably did not intend, but nevertheless could happen, and the escalation will be impossible for Beijing to control. And then a third reason is that this decision will happen within the context of an intense U.S.-China strategic competition that will be really advanced uh, by this point, which means the U.S. is looking for missteps by China to build uh, alliances and partnerships that, that will balance against China and could be turned into an anti-China coalition. A decision to invade Taiwan will play right into the U.S. hands and make it extremely easy for the U.S. to build such a coalition, and that will elevate even further the risk that this decision to invade Taiwan could kick off a major war uh, with potentially catastrophic results for China. And on this note, briefly, if I can talk about the, the PLA uh, advantages. A superior military at the start of war grants a far less advantage than you might think. I just watched the movie Midway. I was talking to someone about it. Uh, Midway, the Battle of Midway, there's a movie about it. It's worth, when you watch that movie, it's worth remembering that at that start of that war, Pearl Harbor, when, when Japan attacked, Japan had the superior military by many accounts. It had finally honed uh, many capabilities, and yet, as the war progressed and it escalated beyond what Japan could control, the war ended in utter catastrophe uh, for Japan. This is a, something China has to think about as it deliberates on a possible invasion. The second big problem for China is that um, an invasion could spell the end of the pursuit of national rejuvenation. 
this is important because the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, has staked its legitimacy on its ability to deliver the China dream. What is the China dream? Well, I've distilled, uh, you know, in an overly simplified manner, aspects of this vision of a rich and powerful China. Uh, but I mean, here, here, is, here is a summary from the 19th Party Congress. This is what the CCP has staked its legitimacy on delivering. From 2035 to 2049, uh, middle of the 21st century, the following goals will have been met. New heights are reached in every dimension of material, political, cultural, and ethical, social, and ecological advancement. That's kind of, you see some of that up there. Uh, modernization of China's system and capacity for governance is achieved. That's listed in the political section. China has become a global leader in terms of composite national strength and international influence. You see some of that listed there. People, Chinese people enjoy happier, safer, and healthier lives. The Chinese nation will become a proud and active member of the community of nations. So this is the vision. This is what the CCP has promised. What is not in that statement? There's actually no mention of Taiwan. Now, I have no doubt that the Chinese leaders are, are very serious about finding some way to make unification happen by this deadline, but it's very telling that they did not, they specifically chose not to put that in there. Be, and for the reason that's, I think, very makes sense, I mean, they can't fully control that situation, so it's very risky for the Chinese to promise something they can't be sure of delivering. But the point is this, <clears throat> a war with the US and the region puts many of these goals at risk, many of these goals at risk. And, uh, and the Chinese can try and take actions to mitigate harm to some of these uh, goals, and I, at least some examples of, of ways to try to mitigate. The problem is the more the Chinese take action to mitigate harm to those goals so, that, so they can try and achieve both unification and China dream, the more they telegraph to the region and to the, to the US that China intends to become a military aggressor, it becomes uh, clear that China is planning an invasion and the more it's going to exacerbate these uh, trends. Sorry, I didn't even go in detail about this slide, but what, what I, I meant to communicate with this slide is China's decision to invade will not be made in a vacuum. Um, they, will, they will be responding to a bunch of influences in the region, and I listed uh, two contrasting scenarios. We're sort of on the right where a lot of the Factors uh, today provide China very little incentive to invade. They have peaceful ways to manage the Taiwan problem, first off, by working with the US, and they've done that in the past. But if we imagine the security situation deteriorating to a point of a lot of antagonism and hostility and uh, insecurity, this is a very volatile, unstable uh, situation with a high risk that any conflict could rapidly escalate into a big war. And again, just to emphasize that the China dream it becomes very difficult to achieve that in such an environment of uh, conflict and escalation. So let's go to the last slide. <clears throat> so this leaves, in my view, a very difficult uh, dilemma for China in coming years. China will have to make some uh, very hard choices. It can choose a path that leads to unification. It can choose a path that leads to an avoidance of war. It can choose a path that leads to the achievement of the China dream. And it can, there are ways to achieve two out of the three, but I think it is impossible for China to achieve all three. There's no realistic way to get there. Something will have to be given up. The question is, what is Taiwan worth to Beijing? Is it worth risking potential catastrophe? Is it worth sacrificing the China dream and the legitimacy of the CCP? This slide lays out four options, four ways for China to deal with this dilemma. The first two, uh, uh, China prioritizes avoiding regional war and achieving the China dream over unification. It can cooperate with the US in the first, this is from Beijing's view, if, they, if they're looking at their options, they probably conclude that working with the US to manage Taiwan means the US isn't gonna be very helpful in facilitating unification. But, Working with the U.S. will help China avoid a war and, and probably can allow China to achieve these uh, rejuvenation goals short of unification. But even if they, China decides, you know what, we're not working with the U.S. anymore, if they avoid an invasion, there's still a good chance of achieving these other two goals. Now, if the leadership says that they are going to prioritize unification, there are two ways to go about it. The first is to plan and prepare extensively 
I think uh, with ample preparation, the PLA can maximize its chances of success. And I'll grant, uh, with thorough preparation, the PLA may be able to pull it off, seize control of Taiwan, subjugate it, occupy it. That can happen, but almost certainly that's going to result in this war, again, with uncontrollable escalation and, uh, and probably the demise of many China dream goals. So it would be, in short, a Pyrrhic victory where the goals the, the, the gain of unification comes at such a high cost that uh, it really is counterproductive and uh, unaffordable. The last and least promising option is uh, what I call the surprise invasion. It, another way China may try to achieve all three is to launch a war so quickly that it, it seizes control of Taiwan before the U.S. and the region can react and uh, before uh, uh, you know, the, the goals are harmed. It's, it, this is an extremely high risk, and uh, it, it makes it even risky for the PLA because the PLA will not be thoroughly prepared. There's a very high risk of operational failure, and uh, it will be extremely unlikely to avoid a regional war because this decision will telegraph to the region that China is a, is a heavily armed, totally unpredictable country that can strike out and attack anybody at random for no cause at all. And that will likely uh, drive the region to uh, anti-China containment and possibly war to stop this out of control aggressor. And, and again, it will end in the failure of the China dream goals. So in short, in the coming years, uh, implications for uh, US, Taiwan, China, US and Taiwan, it is important that they continue to uh, uh, maintain their deterrence posture because China doesn't, it is important not to encourage the Chinese to miscalculate, as uh, Camp Fennell said, and think that a growing military advantage alone will, will solve this dilemma. But I think the real tough question is to China, um, how are they going to think through this challenge and, and this trade-off? It's a difficult one, but um, I, I think it's unavoidable in my view. Thank you for your patience. I look forward to the questions. Great, two terrific presentations. Uh, so the next step is to give each of them uh, no more than five minutes uh, to comment on what the other has said. So I'll turn to you, Jim. Um, and if you want to forfeit your time, that's fine. You can just spend more time taking questions. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll give a few uh, remarks here. First of all, I think, Tim, uh, appreciate your, your comments. And I think it reinforces the fundamentals uh, that we're both seeing, which is that the, the, the change in the balance of military power and the cross-strait uh, dynamic in the last two decades is seriously uh, different, and it's very threatening to Taiwan. And it, in, it, in the foreseeable future, it looks to get even worse. Uh, so I'm glad that we see that and that the rhetoric and the statements are really serious statements from the leadership in China. Uh, your reference to uh, uh, Japan is... <laughs> It actually, it, to me, it makes the case, which is to say that people do irrational things uh, when it's not in, ultimately in their best uh, interest. Uh, so I, I'll just uh, kind of frame this in the terms of why would China do all these things that you correctly point out would be a disaster for them? Why would they still go ahead and do it? And I think it gets back to this issue of 2049, which is to say that China in 2049, whoever is the paramount leader, it's going to stand in front of the forbidden city, and whoever that person is will not be able to stand there and tell, you know, 1.2, 3, 4 billion people of China that they have, you know, achieved the great dream of the restoration and rejuvenation of China without having resolved the Taiwan issue and other disputes, but Taiwan we're talking about. So the thesis of this argument is if we get to 2035 and they still have not resolved this, what is the pressure going to be on the Chinese Communist Party leadership to seek out other options than the diplomatic and economic and information levers of power that they've been using the last 20 years and will continue to use? And that's where I think the Chinese will end up, if they get to that position, the, the voices that will be screaming to use power are going to say, listen, if we don't take this action now, there's no way that we're going to be able to do this and mitigate the risks that will come as Tim's outlined of all these bad things and we won't be able to recover from that. And I'll use the example that the Chinese have already calculated Western thought. Well, they already look down on us in some ways to say we're short attention span. They write about that. They write about our decrepit uh, and immoral and, and decadent ways that we are. 
And then they have this example of, in 1989, they rolled over their people in Tiananmen Square with tanks. And the world saw that and condemned it for what it was, barbarism. Then 19 years later, you go to Beijing, the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics on August 8, 2008, and what did you see? 80,000 people from around the world inside the Bird's Nest Stadium, all there to watch the unveiling of China's opening ceremony of the Olympics. And one person down in there, and you may have heard me say this before, but one person that was in that 80,000 was the President of the United States of America. He was there with his suit coat off, his tie was off, big sweat stains under his armpits. And what did that say to China? It said that in 19 years, the world went from condemning us and calling us barbarians to beating down the doors that even the, the, the most powerful man in the world wanted to come to Beijing to watch the Olympics. So is it gonna be any different in 2030, 2035 if they have not been able to pressurize Taiwan? I don't think so. Lastly, I'll say, I agree with Tim. Uh, he mentioned the word, the U.S. needs to continue its deterrence posture or something to that effect. I agree, but I would also say that we haven't really deterred them. If we can say that the last 20 years have substantially changed the balance of power and the cross-strait dynamic, then we have not deterred them one iota. So we have to do something different. And that's where the debate really should be, is what are we gonna to do to deter them? And that doesn't mean in disengage, but it means deter. Thank you. I'll just make a, a few points. First, um, if in 2035, 95% roughly of the people of Taiwan do not wanna be subsumed under China, you know, it begs the question of why is Beijing so intent on making this happen? It, it sounds like a recipe for a very unstable occupation, possibly perpetually violent and uh, bloody. Uh, I don't see how this helps China's reputation. I don't think, uh, I don't see how this is a recipe for stability across the strait for Asia. There's a lot of potential for uh, awful things to happen in such a situation, assuming that somehow there is this uh, annexation or unification, whatever you want to call it. So, I, you know, I think, again, that just raises the question in 2035, uh, how, if the Chinese leadership is so focused on this, and yet, and, and yet the people of Taiwan, 95% of them don't want this, uh, it, it sounds like a, a recipe for something very ugly, uh, in my view. And uh, I want to just uh, emphasize a point that Kemp Fennell said, I do want to uh, uh, underscore the importance of a strong deterrent posture because in the event, and I grant the, the one case that I cannot uh, fully counter the argument is that of an irrational leader because there's no real argument against an irrational leader. Uh, there is in history plenty of leaders who for imperatives of who knows what push their country to war a critical ingredient in that case will be the military feasibility or the illusion of the military feasibility of an operation. This is something that has uh, fooled many aggressor countries in the past who have made that disastrous first step into invading a neighbor under the illusion that they had some military superiority and they could solve this thing. And it ended in catastrophe in many cases. This would be the case with China as well. If it looks there's an illusion to the leadership, there's an appearance that militarily, this is a very feasible operation with an irrational Chinese leader, he could order the operation to proceed regardless of all the strategic costs. A strong US and Taiwan deterrent posture would make that, very, make that calculation uh, extremely difficult and, and I think made convinced the Chinese leader that this simply is, is unthinkable and that's where I think we wanna be in in such a case, so thanks. Okay, we're now going to give uh, all of you a chance to join this conversation, to pose some um, pointed, challenging questions uh, to, our, uh, to our speakers, and I'm gonna ask you to please make them very concise so that we can uh, get in as many questions as possible, and I think I'll take a couple at a time. So identify yourself and wait for the microphone. We're gonna start with Admiral McDevitt over there. Microphone, she's coming. 
Hi, I'm Mike McDevitt, uh, part-time at uh, CNA. Um, I have a question both for Jim and Tim. For both of you made very compelling arguments, I thought. Uh, Jim, in your case, uh, when you talk about the potential for attack in 2035, you did not address Chinese thinking on Japan. Uh, U.S. land-based air power is all in Japan. So if they're going to worry about U.S. aircraft messing around with an invasion, one would think they have to consider, are we going to go ahead and preemptively attack U.S. air bases that are in Japan and possibly Japanese air bases down in southern Japan that could interfere? So is that, is that part of their thinking, do you suspect, or not? Uh, and for Tim, actually this is for both of you really, in many ways the discussion was, was um, forced to address the issue of the magic word invade. And I think that the discussion could be a little broader by saying, is it possible through military coercion short of invasion that China could achieve its objectives in 2035? And I'm referring specifically to cyber that could bring China's economy to a full stop, or make Taiwan's economy to a full stop. Is that possible by 2035, that they could achieve it through that sort of coercion without shooting? That the panelists can address that, but of course, we're going to vote on the proposition as it's stated. I am going to take one more question uh, before we uh, to Bud Cole. And then we'll come back to the panel and then we'll ask a few more questions. Uh, Bud Cole, Professor Emeritus, National Defense University. I uh, appreciate both arguments. However, I think uh, neither panelists really focused on the primary uh, adjudicator, if you will, of any potential Chinese military action against Taiwan, which is the United States. I think Captain Fennell uh, seriously overestimated Taiwan's military manpower uh, given the island's failure to uh, fulfill its 2000 uh, Defense Author Authorization Acts. But my question is, both panelists talked about a strong deterrent posture against China. And I would ask both panelists, how would they define that on the part of the United States? Okay. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Tim. And uh, please try to be brief so that we can have time for more questions. Sure. So uh, in response to the question about military options short of invasion, I think that this uh, discussion correctly focused on invasion because that is the only military option that guarantees the political outcome, if this is what you want, of removing the government of Taiwan and installing a pro-Beijing government. No other military option does that. Uh, all other military options, including the one you mentioned of, of cyber attacks to uh, break the economy, to me that, that's roughly parallel to using bombs. It's a different way of, of inflicting massive destruction on the civilian economy. And all the data we have shows that that has zero effect in, or very little, it is very unlikely to compel a, a country like Taiwan to submit. Historically, the effect tends to be when you use coercion, whether it's bombing, blockade, other uh, you know, missile strikes, to try and break the will of this other country, it, it just hardens their will. It angers the people, they become uh, turned against you even more. So I think the likely effect of China to go down that path is they're gonna, they would quickly realize that uh, it is not bringing Taiwan any closer to um, wanting to uh, peacefully submit to China. It will drive them to the opposite direction. So that, that's how it respond to that. And then <clears throat> in terms of the U.S. deterrent posture, to me, I think the most important thing the U.S. can do is communicate its seriousness uh, uh, about its uh, security um, commitments and its willingness to stand for them. I think, uh, you know, doing what the U.S. can to, and the U.S. is doing this, things like dispersing uh, its, its forces and um, finding longer range, just making the U.S. force a harder uh, force to target and defeat in a in a, a quick war, I think that reduces the possibility that China will m misjudge its chances. This is what we're trying to get at. We're trying to get the Chinese to get to the point where they cannot be confident that they could, with a, with a, a well-planned 
first strike wipe out a lot of the U.S. military forces and, and gain the advantage? Yeah, to Admiral McDevitt, your question on Japan, clearly uh, U.S. basing in Japan is a major calculus in the PRC, PLA, uh, any military action into, into Taiwan. It's just absolutely essential. And I believe that based on the size of the strategic rocket force and the cyber forces and other things, the strategic support force, that they would not, when the decision is made to go into Taiwan, that they would not be uh, re reluctant to reach out and touch and impact and influence American. I mean, it's all part of their counter intervention strategy. They have to keep us out in the, enough time that they can get in and get a footprint. Um, and then I agree with what Tim said about these other options. I think China will do everything up to that point, uh, non-kinetically, uh, to try to influence the people in Taipei to capitulate. Uh, but I also agree with what Tim said is that history has shown that usually people won't, won't bend to those kinds of pressures and the only thing that really works is a, a bayonet in your gut. Um, Bud, uh, maybe, I didn't, maybe I wasn't clear, I, I believe that uh, in terms of the Chinese calculus that they have in their minds convinced themselves increasingly so in the last five years and will continue to get increasingly convinced that the U.S. capabilities as they exist today, which are essentially a flat line for the last 25, 30 years in terms of our presence and capability, uh, is something that they can overcome. Uh, and so I don't believe we've deterred them at all. And so uh, maybe I misspoke if I said that. I think we need to do some dramatic things. And one of them is, and I've been crying for this, is, and I, maybe I disagree with Senator Perdue's comments earlier, which is 355 is not enough. We need more naval vessels. So I agree with him that one-third, one-third, one-third in that force allocation in the DOD budget ain't going to cut it. We've got to build up our Navy. Uh, and you can criticize me and say, well, you're in the Navy and you're just a navalist. And, and I would say, yes, that's true. I spent my career in the Navy, and I believe that our Navy is needed today. We neglected it for the last three decades for other reasons, and we won't go into why those reasons are valid or not. But today, our Navy is not ready to defend America's national interest. And we need to be able to produce ships, as many or as equal to that the Chinese can. Uh, they're out producing us four to five to one over the last decade. For every one ship we produce, China produces four or five, okay? And they're now matching us in tonnage as they pump out these carriers and Type 075 large amphibious helicopter carriers, and we need to be able to match that. And it's going to be hard, and it's going to cause some disturbances in the way that this town spends money. But if we don't do it, then we'll all have to learn Mandarin. Okay, two more questions. Okay, this woman here. Yes. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Anne Tan from the Center for China and Globalization, um, a Beijing-based Chinese think tank. Um, I just, I was under the impression uh, that from James comments that um, Beijing has been doing or announcing something for the preparation for such contingency. For me, the word contingency is the key word here. So I was wondering, um, um, both panelists can elaborate on what kind of contingency would that be? Because the proposition to me seems quite vague, while both sides do not agree on peaceful reunification. So are we talking about some sort of um, a, a, a possible deal or um, some contingencies like, um, contingencies like the Hong Kong situation or um, some contingencies from the Taiwan side um, on, the, on James' proposition, it seems like China is preparing for the worst case scenario, while um, Tim is talking about some sort of uh, non-dynamic situation on both sides. So I was just wondering, on what, 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 what's your take on um, the con con contingency? And the second point is, uh, when we are talking about military feasibility, so how do we explain the Chinese decision to end the Korean War? That, uh, that was how do you explain the Chinese decision to enter the Korean War? So is there any relevance um, uh, to that point? Okay, so we're going to take one more question. We'll take one from the back. Go ahead. Brief, please. Uh, hi. 
so far, uh, identify our yourself, please. Oh, sorry, uh, Jeff Chen with the China Scope. So far, our discussion has been based upon the assumption that the CCP is going to rule the rule China uh, until 2035 and beyond. Uh, I have not heard any discussion about the, the possibility of Chinese people abandoning CCP. Um, if that happens, probably all this threat that we are seeing now is no longer going to exist. And actually, in the Asian book, the, the book, The Art of the War, there's all a right, I just, I just need you to ask a question. All right, so I just, uh, if we open up the, um, the Great Firewall, probably Chinese people will get information uh, of independent source, and they will no longer be brainwa brainwashed, and uh, they will probably see you the CCP differently. You have not asked a question yet. The question is, uh, how uh, are the experts are going to see the possi possibility of that happening? Okay, great. And I do think that actually Tim Heath in his presentation suggested that if China were a democracy that this might not have much of an impact, but we can ask both to comment on that again. We'll start with you this time, Jim. Uh, and uh, related to your questions about contingency, uh, I, I think it's natural for militaries to plan for contingencies. That's what I did in my career. Every military I've ever operated with around the world does that. Uh, but that doesn't lessen the impact of the, the global and regional uh, political situation that will be existing in that time frame. And again, if China has not been able to resolve what they believe is their core issue, their sovereign territory, there are going to be those people that have been working on that contingency. I mean, today they've been working on it at least for 20 years. If we had another decade, that's 30 years of development of a war plan. And when all the other options have failed, seemingly failed in their eyes, the pressure to use that contingency is going to be great, uh, in my opinion. Uh, regarding Korea, I think that's uh, a, a good point. <laughs> China did get involved with Korea. They're not adverse to using their military to, to take what they want. And we've seen that in, in Vietnam. We saw it in India. So the idea that China hasn't used military force to take what they want is a misnomer. We also saw it in the South China Sea against the Philippines, against other uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, in 1988 with the massacre of Vietnamese sailors. So the, the actual willingness of the PRC to use military force is, is unquestioned in my mind. And then Jeff, uh, your question I would summarize as regime change. I mean, you're essentially arguing, could the CCP be kicked out? And I hope they are, that's my desire. But as a military planner and somebody that's talking about great power competition and deterrence, I can't count on that. So what I need to count on is big guns and big navy and long-range missiles that can fly faster and maneuver better than Chinese so that they at night go home and say, I really need to recalculate this and see if I want to do it. <clears throat> on the uh, regime change issue, I'll, I'll just say be careful what you ask for. Uh, as unsavory as the CCP might be and uh, you know, offensive, some of their policies, there's no guarantee that if they collapse and somebody else came in place that whoever came next would be better. I mean, it could be worse. That's happened uh, in histories uh, before. Uh, and then in terms of contingency, I, I agree with Camp Fennell. All militaries plan for contingencies and the Chinese leadership have outlined, you know, red lines, so to speak. Um, but in my view, the decision to invade Taiwan will, will be made regardless in some ways uh, of some specific action by Taiwan. And the reason why is that uh, it, it is these, it will be, and I had a previous slide, it will be these broader structural drivers that will increase the incentive to pursue a military option. There's no shortage of excuses China could cite today if it wanted to invade. You know, you have a president of Taiwan who belongs to a political party that is openly committed to independence. Uh, and there you have elections where the people of Taiwan are choosing their national, their, their leader and, and carrying on like a national government. In 1999 or 2000, 2000, Premier Zhu Rongji made threats saying that, uh, hinting that if the people of Taiwan voted for a DPP candidate as president, uh, he, he seemed to hint that there could be war. And of course they didn't, and the reason why they didn't is because there are all these other incentives to peacefully manage the problem. As, as unpleasant and as difficult as it was, 
the, the military option just didn't make sense. So we have to think of a situation where the military option becomes more attractive, and in that case, it almost doesn't matter what Taiwan does. It's, it's the calculation in Beijing of how much do they want this to happen. Then they can find whatever excuse they want. Now, that doesn't mean Taiwan should do something reckless and, and foolish. I think there are lots of things Taiwan could do that would really hurt their interests and could drive the U.S. and Chinese to work together if, if they were irresponsible and, and making you know, very reckless political acts. But if Taiwan even just kept a low profile and tried to avoid offensive uh, actions, that's no guarantee that at some point the Chinese might decide, you know what, enough is enough. Uh, for whatever reason, we need to find an excuse. They could easily find one if they really wanted to um, go down this route. All right, I think we have time for two last questions. If you're sitting to the right or left of me and uh, the lecterns are blocking my vision, then you'll just have to stand up, and I apologize. All right, so we will take a question from here. Hi, I'm Stephen. I work at the Institute for China American Studies. Uh, in a lot of the discussion that we've had, you guys seem to be talking a lot about U.S. deterrence and what China's going to do with Taiwan. Obviously, China doesn't make these decisions in a vacuum. There's two political developments in the past few months that are particularly striking to me in relation to this. Uh, one on the executive branch side is the developments with the Kurds in Syria, which might seem to suggest that the U.S. wouldn't be as much of a deter if China wanted to invade Taiwan. But on the other end, the legislative branch just passed legislation about Hong Kong. So I'm curious to hear about what you guys think these two developments would impact China's calculation of U.S. deterrence. Okay, and one last question on this side, standing up in the back over here. Hi, I'm Matt Brazil. I'm from the Jamestown Foundation, temporarily imported from Silicon Valley. So um, what event or development between now and 2035 would change your mind? That's a question for both. Okay, I like that question. That's terrific. Okay, so short answers from both, and then while they are answering, um, please prepare your final votes. Okay, Jim. Okay, uh, Stephen, uh, on your question about uh, these political uh, events that you listed having an impact on China's resolve um, and, and also allied resolve and trust and confidence in America's deterrence, um, I think they do have an impact. And I think that there's been a struggle in this town to diminish America's involvement in uh, alliances. And I think uh, Senator Perdue talked about how actually we're actually engaging a lot more in many different ways, and so that's important. And I think the, the congressional passage of this Hong Kong uh, Human Rights and, and Democracy Act was really important, and the president's signature unprecedented in 40 years of U.S. PRC relations and sends a dramatic signal to Beijing that they need to be uh, uh, on notice. But we have to back that up with other tangible, hard actions. Uh, and then, Matt, on your question about what could happen between now and 2035 that would change my mind, well, obviously, if the, if the CCP was overthrown, then that would change my mind. But if they're still there, nothing's going to change my mind. Okay, Tim. Um, in terms of the deterrence question and, and what the executive and legislature are doing, you know, to me, I think the biggest deterrent to China is the uncertainty of of where war could go. To me, that is just it's so powerful, and there's no way the Chinese can get around it. You cannot control escalation when two superpower, great powers are involved. Uh, so that is a deterrent for the U.S. You know, I, I recall when the Chinese were carrying out their artificial island construction in the South China Sea, and I remember American commentators calling for hard, tough action. The, the U.S. government rightfully hesitated to go down a path of violence because it, there's just, it's unclear and very dangerous uh, where that situation could go. The U.S. could not control where that, that might lead. Similarly with China, even if it has the advantage, looks on the ground and sees there's not enough U.S. ships or aircraft, it looks like there's, a, there's an opportunity here, extremely high risk. They, they may even win the first clash, but there's no way the Chinese leadership could be confident they could bring this to an end. There's a very high chance the U.S. will not want to quit, and the situation will escalate and escalate and escalate, and 
and the Chinese will find themselves in a, a very big hole and with no way out. And then in this, what would, uh, this question about what would change my mind, a variant actually of uh, Jim's uh, answer, I think is somehow the emergence of a irrational, very nationalistic leader who, who willfully cho chooses to go down a, a very self-destructive path, uh, you know, a return of kind of an imperial Japan type mentality or Nazi Germany type mentality. Doesn't have to be that kind of ideology, but some, you know, uh, extreme ideology, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I think is very implausible, but to me, if for whatever reason, some kind of leader emerged like that and willfully chose to go down a path of, uh, uh, territorial aggrandizement and uh, invasion and subjugation of neighbors, it'd be self-destructive and it'd be real disaster for China. But in that situation, I could see the leadership choosing to invade Taiwan. Okay. Um, this has been a very rich discussion. And of course, that's the primary purpose uh, of our conference today, is to have that rich discussion because there really is no right or wrong answer for any of these propositions. But we hope that both of our speakers um, have gotten you thinking uh, about this question. I'm gonna repeat the proposition and ask you all to vote. If Beijing and Taipei do not come to an agreement on unification by 2035, China will use military force to invade Taiwan. I'm going to give you uh, another minute or two to cast your votes. Prior to our debate, we only had 89 people who cast their votes. And I know there's a lot more than 89 people in this room. So I'm going to reiterate, uh, this is all anonymous. No, there's, there's no test, and uh, nobody's going to know which way you voted. Uh, but I'd like to get as many people as possible uh, to have their votes uh, registered. If you weren't in any way impacted by uh, the, the speakers, that our, our debaters, that's fine. You can have your own views, but uh, we'd like to hear what they are. I'm going to remind you what the, uh, the vote was before uh, our debate, and it was 33% uh, yes and 65% no. So we're going to see whether there's been any significant change uh, after uh, the debate. In, in many of our conferences in the past, we've had a small change, but occasionally we've had a complete flip in, in the direction of uh, what, uh, what people think about this issue. Uh, but it is rare, but it has happened. Um, so I'm going to give you all another 30 seconds to register your votes. Um, and please do so. We've had a few more people enter the debate, right? So that's great. We have now uh, 118, but I know there's many more than 118 in the room. So please go ahead and register your votes in the final seconds before we uh, close the voting. All right, we have 61% yes. 38% no, uh, so uh, we still have the majority of people who think that, uh, that China will not use military force uh, against, uh, against Taiwan, uh, but we have had a little bit of movement. <laughs> So we'll give you credit for that, Jim. It's been a terrific discussion. Please join me in thanking our speakers, Tim Heath and Jim Fennell. And you all have 15 minutes for a coffee break. We'll see you back here. <laughs>